Coral Even Song beginning third week of Trinity Term on this sixth Sunday of Easter at St. Hughes College in the University of Oxford. We are glad you've joined us, whoever and wherever you are. Tonight, in addition to our lovely music from the choir, we have Rabbi Michael Rosenfeld Schuler as our special guest speaker, joining us from the Oxford University Jewish Chaplaincy. Michael leads the University Jewish Chaplaincy with his wife, Tracy and they are our dear friends indeed. All that you need you will find on your screen, including any words to follow, and you're always very welcome to join in with us. We start with our traditional greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. We listen now to our opening hymn sung by the Chapel Choir. Oh, 
A reading from the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Eli Melech's family go to Moab. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Eli Melech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Shileon. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Eli Melech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there for about ten years, both Marlon and Shileon also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. Naomi and her Moabite daughters-in-law. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return to you, to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, why would you wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Arthur kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you, or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi turned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thanks very much to Chaplain, uh, to Sean and St. Hughes College for inviting me to speak and to contribute uh, some thoughts to, uh, to the service this evening. Um, so the reading today was that of, uh, for Ruth, the first chapter of, of Ruth. And the reason that that was chosen was because there's a connection between the Jewish festival of Shavuot, uh, which is coming up in the next week. Uh, and Shavuot is in English is usually referred to as Pentecost. Um, and the reasons for that is we will we'll discuss t today. Uh, it celebrates the seven weeks um, between Passover and Shavuot. Um, and I'd like to address this three fundamental teachings that relate to the story of Ruth and this time of year, and as well to a bit of Jewish thought. Uh, so the reason and the connection with Ruth of why Ruth is read during Shavuot is during Pentecost uh, in synagogue, it's read. And that's because in the story, uh, Naomi and Ruth return to this place, place Bethlehem, Bethlehem. They return there and the people are harvesting. Uh, and the time of the harvest is not just any kind of harvest, but it's the grain harvest, uh, which is associated with uh, this particular time of year, the spring or early summer, uh, which is when this festival is always falling. And I suppose there's an additional layer that, uh, that I chose the first chapter of Ruth, and that is about migration and movement. And the story begins in the land of Beit Lechem, uh, Bethlehem, and there's a famine in the land, and the main characters leave, choose to go, uh, and they leave to go to this place called Moab. Um, now, there are some immediate, I guess, observations about literary techniques and names, uh, one of them is, well, Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, literally means the house of bread. And now, it should be a place which is overflowing with food based on its name, yet we see that there is famine there. And the other is the place that the individuals choose to go to. Their departure and the place they go is Moab. Now, Moab is a really interesting name because it has these connections uh, biblical connections going back to uh, Genesis and the story of Lot. Now we know that Lot, when uh, Stom and Amorak Mora were destroyed, that Lot took refuge in some caves uh, with his two daughters. And the horrific story of what happens with Lot and his two daughters, they thought that the world had ended, was destroyed, uh, and the daughters get him drunk and they sleep with him. And one of the children that it results uh, comes from that experience uh, was named Moab. Uh, Me'av in Hebrew, Me means from, and Av means father. So from father, uh, which is the name of, of the child that was, that was given. And um, biblically, the place of Moab are the descendants of, of um, fr from that, from Lot and, and his daughter. Um, so... That's an interesting uh, point as well. The, the place of, uh, the, the name of Naomi as well is, requires a bit of a reflection. Na Naomi uh, is named, its Hebrew word means uh, naim, it means pleasant. Uh, yet her experience, uh, Naomi in the Ruth story, Naomi is somebody that um, doesn't have a very pleasant experience. Um, there's a lot of death surrounding her, her family. And even when she refers to herself, she says, I'm not, don't call me, this is my, I'm, I'm bitter. Uh, my name is Mara, uh, I'm bitter now. Um, and she changes her name almost having complete uh, extreme opposites from going from pleasant to, um, to, being, to being bitter. The family of Naomi, uh, they left Bethlehem intending to stay for the duration of the famine. Uh, but they ultimately they settle in, in Moab. And the rabbis of antiquity were critical of uh, Naomi's family, Elimelech and uh, Machlon and Chilion, for, for leaving uh, Beit Lechem and not staying. The Midrash says, the Midrash is a, a collection of rabbinic 
uh, sources that, um, that, that kind of fill in the blanks of some of the questions that, that remain uh, from, the, from the story. And the Midrash, the rabbis of antiquity, uh, ask the question, why was Elimelech punished? And the response that they offer is that he was among the greatest people in the country. And what is one of the benefactors of his generation? And when the years of famine came, he said, now all of Israel will surround my doorway. This one will come with his alms box, and that one with their alms box. So he stood up and he ran away. He fled and he went to Moab. It seems that there's a significant critique of the choices he made, that he was a leader. And rather than engaging with his leadership and supporting the people that needed him, he decided to flee and he left. And the rabbis of antiquity understand that this was uh, the reason for his um, this is like a, a sin, something he did that was deeply problematic, uh, running away from, from his uh, calling or something that he needed to do or should have, have done. Uh, and this was the reason for his punishment. He ultimately died in, in, in Moab. Um, the hero's journey for Ruth, though, uh, is all a bit difficult. She is from Moab and chooses to leave there to return with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth, her name in, in Hebrew is uh, it's a bit unclear of where it's coming from, uh, the, the root word of it, but it, it's often associated with uh, saturation or being satiated. Uh, it's the same word, that root construct, that, that comes up in the verse from, from Psalms, uh, from uh, my cup overflows, uh, kosi rivaya is the, is the Hebrew there which is associated with uh, being something overflowing. So the actual day of Shavuot, or Pentecost, is uh, disputed in, in the Talmud, uh, which is the rabbinic literature from about 1800 years ago. And in antiquity, there was a dispute between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. These were two different groups that were around, um, around the time of the destruction of the temple and beforehand. And the question emerged about when is this day? When should it be? The, it gets a bit confusing because the reference in the Bible is that of, uh, you should start, the, the people should start counting for 49 days, seven weeks, um, following on from the day after the Sabbath. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's mimochorat ha-shabbat, from the day, after, uh, the day after the Shabbat, the day after Sabbath. The Sadducees read this literally, and that meant that the Jewish Sabbath was always on Saturday. So the day after the Sabbath uh, would have been Sunday. So therefore, every Shavuot would always be on, uh, on, a, on a Sunday for the Sadducees. The Pharisees read this differently and said that, no, it should always be the counting should start the day after um, Passover, uh, the, the festival of, of Passover, uh, which is, is always seven weeks before Shavuot. And there's this connection between Passover and, and Shavuot. Uh, I'd just like to, to think for a moment about dispute in Judaism and Jewish thought. And it's a really interesting thing because Jewish uh, rabbinic literature is replete with dispute all the time. There's just arguments. There's a well-known joke, uh, um, yeah, like, um, with every question, there's, you know, two, two Jews, and how many opinions? There are three opinions. So it's, it's constantly, uh, there seems to be dispute and um, argument or debate. Now, what's really interesting here, I think, that, uh, that can shed some light for, for us is about the concept of Jewish debate or Jewish dispute. The Hebrew word is machloket, is the Hebrew word for debate or dispute, argument. And the uh, root word of it comes from the word of uh, parts. Um, now, usually when we think about a debate, we think, well, I'm going to present my side, you'll present your side. One of us will hopefully be, one of us, I hope I'll be right, and I hope you'll be wrong. 
and one of us will emerge as victor of the debate and winner uh, and win the debate. Now, what's interesting with the word machloket apart is that it seems to say that there's this concept and we each have a part of that concept. So if there's a debate going on, I have uh, an approach or a, a section or an element of, of, of it, and you do too. And it could be, perhaps I would believe that my view is you know, more important or more predominant or is, um, is fundamental, and you believe that yours is predominant as well. But the important thing is that these are two elements or they're multiple layers of understanding the truth or understanding what's really going on. Uh, and I think about this sometimes using a metaphor from science of uh, light refraction, of light going through a prism. And when light is it goes through the prism, uh, we know that it comes out with Roy G. Biv of different colors which emerge from it. Now, each one of those colors is not on the other side of, of the prism, but we'd say that it's all coming from, from the same source. And I think that this kind of a, a metaphor is really helpful in understanding Jewish debate or the debate that was seen as in a positive way in antiquity from, from the rabbis. And I think that's really important to understand, uh, particularly today when the divisive nature of, um, of discourse uh, today is often, I think, really very much missing this and lacking this kind of attitude towards uh, respect or seeing the other as having something to, to offer or some other part that's missing from, from the big picture. Um, this time of year is filled with exams, uh, prelims, finalists, and for some it's transitioning from university life to whatever's the next chapter. And the Ruth story encourages me or encourages us to focus on doing things for the right reason, looking for motivation or what is the motivation for our actions. And I suppose above all, given the rabbi's critique of Elimelech, is the uh, importance of stepping up and stepping up for leadership and not running away from it and not running away from challenges, but rather um, welcoming them. And no doubt there'll be numerous opportunities that will be encountered for all of us. And I suppose the question is, is how to respond to them and the choice which is there similar to Naomi or Ruth or Elimelech of what to do. And regardless, I suppose, if one is departing Oxford, uh, like Naomi's family leaving Bethlehem, or returning, as she did, uh, and coming back to Oxford again in the near future, may there be a blessing this week and with this term that's with peaceful transitions and the ability to engage in debate and express opinions and listen to other opinions and hear another voice. Thank you for joining us for this third Coralivan Song of Trinity term. Thanks to all who have contributed, including our choir with Dan Chambers, John T. Watt, Jiun Lee and Taro Kobayashi for the music and the singing, to the choir and John T. for prelude, and postlude, and to Emily for our reading. Especially we thank Rabbi Mikhail for a wonderful address. We shall have drinks together at approximately 7 p.m. Uh, that's British summer time, and the link is provided in the comments of this service. Next week we'll be back on Sunday, and we hope that you may join us then. A traditional ending. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.